Well, happy Mother's Day to our mothers and really to all the ladies. We uh, have a belief in our church that it's just not those who have physically given birth to kids, but if you are a lady in our church uh, at any age, uh, there's somebody younger than you watching and being aware of what you do. Uh, I say to some of our high school girls on a regular basis, please be a great role model for my daughter. And uh, so whatever age you are, happy Mother's Day, whether you are physically uh, a mother or not, you represent uh, God's love from a female perspective, and so thank you for that. And so uh, with it being Mother's Day, we, we were wrapping up the series, and we thought, how cool is this? We're going to talk about families and even family dysfunctions on, on Mother's Day because uh, it's just a beautiful time to really grab everybody together and say, hey, Joseph's story begins and concludes uh, with this idea that, that we have a, a family that we're, we're reconciling, that we're bringing back together. Now, now some of you uh, might be a little uncomfortable talking about families because families can be wonderful, but they can be frightening, right? Right? I mean, some days you wish you could walk around with a bag on your head saying, I'm not with them, right? You know, you're, you're in the car, your mom drops you off to school, and you've already ducked in the back seat pretending that, you know, I'm not with her, and you, you crawl out through the trunk, right? That's how you got out of your car when you got dropped off, right? Because you didn't want to be known that you were with your, your parents and your mom and dad. And everybody's got that crazy uncle like Stefan, right? Yeah, but, I mean, everybody's got one of those, right, that you're kind of like, yeah, yeah, he's sort of with us, right? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what to do with him, and uh, you just keep hoping that he doesn't show up at the next event, right? right? And, 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 and you try to hide from your family sometimes, right? But here's, here's one of the scary truths about life, is that you can try to hide from your family, but you can't hide from the influence of your family. Let me say that again. You can try to hide from your family, but you can't hide from the influence of your family. No matter how much you get away, no matter how you move across the country, you move across the world, your influence of your family is still with you. Now, some of you, some of you, you fight like your parents fought. You know why? Because you grew up in a household and that's how you learned to fight and learned how to handle this. And so you get in an argument and your spouse so desperately wants to say it to you that, it, you know, they even call you by your mother's name. I'll say it to Allie on occasion. I'll say, Ellen, by the way, the fight never takes a turn for the better at that point in time. It just, it's all downhill from there. She says, I'm not my mother, and now I'm going to kill you. You know, it's just, it's all downhill from there. And then I have to go to counseling for all the abuse I receive. <laughs> yeah, and if you're dating, you've watched how your, your mother and father interact, and you, as a guy, you've watched how your dad treated your mom and how your mom treated your dad, and you're looking for a gal that kind of, again, if you thought your parents did it right, if you thought man, mom and dad love each other, and you're looking for a gal then that treated, that treats you like your mom treated your dad. Did you know that? I mean, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for someone who treats you. And if you're a gal, your dad has set the standard for care. This is why it's so important for dads to take their daughters out on dates and open doors and say, I love you, and pay for the meal and, and, and take them. Just spoil them to death because we set the standard of what it's going to be like for our daughters when they start dating. And they're looking for a guy that treats them like their dad treats their mom. Oh, that's huge. That's huge. Let me, just, let me just say this. On a regular basis, I have to say to some of our ladies in the church, by being in that relationship, you are teaching your daughter what her future relationships are going to be like. Do you really want her to be in an abusive relationship? Well, no. Well, then why would you set that example by staying in one yourself? Because you're setting her up for this is what you should expect from a guy, right? Right? Because we can't hide from the influence of our family. How you handle money, how you handle money, how you, you interact with politics and religion. And this is the way it works. Either you go, I like how my mother and father did that and I want to be like them. Or you said, I hate how my mother and father did that. And you swung the pendulum completely over here. And so when mom and dad fought, if one of them gave each other silent treatment, and you went, I never want to do that. I never want to be in a relationship where I receive or give the silent treatment. You swung the pendulum way over here, and now you're afraid of silence in a relationship. 
Like if your husband comes in and, and you're talking to him and he's like, well, I just need 10 minutes here. Just, uh, just give me 10 minutes of silence. I just got home, dear. And you're like, no, we can't have silence. We have to talk through this. We have to do it now. And, and why are you so crazy about that? Because, because you watched your mom and dad give the silent treatment and then nothing got solved, right? It got swept under the rug and we pretended that the rug that was 10 foot tall that you couldn't walk around in the room wasn't there. And you went, I never want to be like that. And so you swung the pendulum the other way because why? We can't hide from the influence that our families have on us. What's scary is that our behaviors can be traced in cycles of family behavior and we can even become, we can even get to the place where we predict your actions. Did you know that? We can even predict your actions. Yeah. An example is we see the young lady whose uh, father is a you know, he drinks too much. He comes home and he, he beats his wife. And whether she, the daughter, wants to or not, but guess what kind of guy she's more than likely going to date? Is she going to date someone emotionally healthy that cares for her? No. More often than not, we see the young lady go, I'm going to marry someone who is like my dad someone dysfunctional. It's the first guy willing to show her any kind of attention because she so longs for some kind of healthy male attention and, and she hasn't gotten it and now she just marries the first bozo she comes up with. Why? Because she hasn't been taught to wait for the right person to come along. Are you with me so far? <coughs> Guys who see their, their parents drink or cope with uh, stress and in unhealthy ways often end up coping in the same manner. It's because we, we, we learn these behaviors, whether cognitively or subconsciously, we go, that's how to behave. That's how to handle stress. That's how to deal with this situation. That's how to deal with this. Parents, this is one of the reasons why it's so important that your kids on occasion see you working out a tough situation. You don't have to call it fighting, but it's so important for your kids to see you in a healthy conversation about something that's very serious going, we're trying to work this out and to see you compromise and to say you're sorry and to see you interact in a relationship and go, oh, when I get older, that's how it's supposed to happen. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. You ready? The good news is that we can break the cycles of behavior and dysfunction in our relationships. All right? Amen to that? Some of you come out of families where you're like, amen! I am not my mother. Right? I don't have to be like grandpa. Right? You don't have to repeat the same behaviors and mistakes that our parents or grandparents made. I am a wonderful byproduct of people that chose to break the cycle. My great-grandfather beat his son so badly that the seven sons banded together and said, we will kill you the next time you lay a hand on us. I don't know how crazy life is there, but when your sons band together to kill you, I think that's pretty dysfunctional. And my grandfather, when my dad was born, said, I will not behave and treat him like that. And we began to break the cycle and become more healthy with every generation from there on out. It didn't immediately result in health. My father and grandfather still had dysfunction in their relationship, but thank goodness he chose to break the cycle and didn't beat my dad. And from there on, we began to continue to create different healthy systems in the family. Now, what's really fun and exciting is that, that we've been studying the story about Joseph now for like five weeks, and we're here at the conclusion of the story. And when you get to the story of Joseph, you get to this beautiful family mess. You know what a beautiful family mess is? It's like, it's just when you go to Christmas and you just kind of stare around the room and go, dear God, how did we get together? Are we going to make it one more Christmas? Is anybody going to spike the punch and try to kill Aunt Martha this year? Right? You've been at those family gatherings, right? Where you're just sitting there thinking to yourself, do we need to call the cops this year? Right? And when you get to Joseph's family, that's what kind of a, a family atmosphere you get. And the message today teaches us some keys to how to break family dysfunction and how to get healthy. And it's a story about how that takes place over a long period of time. Now, how many of you like soap operas? Come on, get your hands wet. Don't give me the half hand. Give me hands wet. If you like soap operas, come on, what's your favorite? Give me a couple of examples. Days of Our Lives. What was it? Young and the Restless. Any others? Okay. 
I didn't even know that one was out. Well, here's what I want you to know. Long before there were soap operas, there was not the young and the restless because they were old. There was just the restless. The Bible invented soap operas. You probably didn't know that. But today we're going to welcome you to the biblical story of the restless. You ready? God, come on, that was cool with the music and all. The guys upstairs are pretty good, aren't they? Yeah. All right, so, so here's where we go. We start the story with Abraham and Sarah. Now, you may not know who these people are. You may be well aware who they are. But Abraham is called Father Abraham, and he is the start of the new nation. God calls him out of the land of Earth. It's this amazing, rich land, and says, hey, I just want you to, to trust me, and we're going to go into the desert, and I'm going to take you to the place that's your new home. And Abraham says, okay. And if you grew up in Sunday school a long time ago, you probably sang the song like Father Abraham and many sons and for whatever reason, we moved our right arm and left leg, and it, it really was about just keeping kids' attention. It had nothing to do with the Bible at all. It was just like, hey, let's just dance, all right? And, and so you may have learned that song, you may have not, but the idea is this, that when we trace our biblical lineage, those of us who believe in Jesus ultimately, in one way or another, call Abraham our father, whether it's a biological connection or a spiritual connection, Abraham is the father of our faith. Abraham is the father of our faith. And Abraham's wife was named Sarah, and Sarah was uh, a barren. And you remember at, at like age 90, God appears and says, hey, you're going to have kids. And like at 99, they have kids, which is absolutely crazy, right? I hung out with my grandma yesterday, and she could barely walk to the restroom. She's got a little stroller. She doesn't remember who I am half the time. And I can't imagine her having kids. Like, I just think that's a bad deal. Okay, I just, it's not going to happen, all right? And so here's Abraham and Sarah in this amazing story. At the age of like 99, they have kids, and it's just an amazing story. But what's really cool is that the Bible isn't a fictional book. In your fictional books, your heroes are like, man, they, they never do anything wrong. But the Bible records all the mistakes our heroes make. And so our father, Abraham, is really the, the beginning of lies, yeah, check this out. The story of Abraham is not once, but twice he goes into a new land. And some a ruler of that land comes up to him and goes, hey, that lady's pretty hot. And what Abraham should say is, thank you, this is my wife. Instead, what Abraham does is go, would you like to marry her? Yeah. Yeah. Now, how many of you guys think that's going to work well in your relationship? Right? You go over to the Capitol building, right? And, and out steps the governor of Ohio. And he goes, hey, that lady's pretty good looking. Thank you. Not my wife. Would you like to marry her? Right? Is this going to go well when you get home? No. No. And how many of you ladies are really excited about your husband going, you know, like, hey, take her? No, nobody's really excited? That's good. You have healthy marriages. All right? That's good. All right? All right here's, here's what I want you to think about. Can you imagine what that does to Sarah? Like, we watch the movies, right? And we want that guy who's going to die to defend us, right? And here's Abraham. I'm going to die, and I'm shoving you away to save my hand. Hide, right? Right? It's like the Titanic. I love you forever, Leo. Oh, wait, you're frozen. <laughs> yeah, great love story. All right, Abraham and Sarah have a son. The son's name is Isaac, right? And Isaac, all right, his father says, hey, we can't find any girls around here that are good for you to date. I don't know if that's a regular problem. We don't have that problem at Fairborn. There's lots of great girls even right here in our service. Let me hear you, teenage ladies. That was really sad. <laughs> Some of them were sitting there like, is he, is he talking about us right now? Should, should, I, should I or not? All right. So uh, Isaac is sent by his father back to a, a homeland to pick up a girl. And when you pick up a girl in the Bible, you, you go to the well. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the well was like the modern day bar, okay? It's really funny because when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in John 4, we think, ooh, how spiritual. No, he's, Jesus really went to hang out at the bar, okay? There's no stories about, hey, we went to the well and got water, okay? That story doesn't really exist. When we see the well in the Bible, we go, somebody's going to get hitched, all right? And so <laughs> Isaac goes to the bar, at the time, the well, hmm, 
all right? And he meets Rebecca, who becomes his wife. And there's, again, a, a similar story, all right? Rebecca's barren, but ultimately God intervenes, okay? And Isaac and Rebecca have two sons. You remember what their names were? This is Bible trivia. If you don't know, that's okay. If you know, you give yourself five points, okay? Uh, Isaac and Rebecca have two sons named Jacob and Esau. Okay, so Abraham goes to Isaac, and Isaac goes to Jacob and Esau, and that's the family tree. And they get this name because Jacob means heel grabber. These are twins that are born. So she goes from being barren to having twins, which, by the way, is my wife's reoccurring nightmare that she has twins. All right? I don't know why it's a recurring nightmare. It's kind of weird because neither of us even have the ability to make kids anymore. But she still has that dream, okay? It's overshare, sorry. And so here, here's the, the way that works is that when Jacob, Esau is born first. And when Esau comes out, Jacob has a hold of his leg, has a hold of his heel. And Jacob literally means heel grabber. And so in the story, it's set up that, hey, there's going to be great conflict between these two. One of them is grabbing the heel of the other. And sure enough, that's what we get. We get great conflict. Jacob comes from a family of deceivers, right? And so what's his natural mode of action when it comes time to have tough decisions or when it comes time to get ahead in life? He's going to deceive and become the trickster. And so this is how this works. One day Esau, oh, by the way, this is my kids love this part of the story. <laughs> Esau goes out to hunt for food and he's supposed to bring it back. And uh, uh, Jacob is making soup, and Esau shows up, and he's like, I'm starving. And Jake, Jacob sees an opportunity, and he says, I'll give you this bowl of Campbell chicken noodle soup with stars in it if you trade me your birthright. And Esau goes, oh, what good is a birthright to me if I'm dead? And he trades his future for a moment of pleasure. Let me say that again because hoo, hoo, hoo. that one could be a little dangerous right he trades his future for a moment of pleasure and satisfaction wow what my kids love about the story is Esau's a hairy dude I don't know if you knew this in the story but Esau is so hairy that uh, the father is going to give the blessing to his children and Jacob and Rebecca, his mom, get together and they begin to plot against how to steal the birthright from their brother. And Esau's so hairy, all right, physically hairy, that he goes out to hunt and Jacob kills a goat and wraps the goat skin around his arm and goes in and his dad feels his arm and goes, oh, hey, that's Esau. Now, how hairy do you have to be? That goat skin feels like your arm, right? That's just gross, okay? That's just a crazy Bible story, right? This is, a hair, this is like the pre-dawn of, of the werewolf man, okay? It's in the Bible. The werewolf man's in the Bible. Right there it is, right? And, and so Jacob ultimately steals Esau's birthright by lying and deceiving all right, deceiving his own father in cahoots with his mom. All right, do you see the dysfunction of lying continued down generation to generation? Where do you think he learned that? Yeah, that's what grandpa taught me. That's how I, I learned how to live, right? Now, Jacob becomes afraid that Esau is going to kill him, which, again, I would probably think is not uh, an extreme way to go. I mean, I've thought about killing Nathan several times. Just I've never followed through on it. Uh, I just still hold the title belt in basketball, and he's been trying to get it for years. Yep, wanted to make sure I got that one in there. <laughs> Good looking, brother. <laughs> See if that gets you the belt. So uh, Jacob flees, and he runs away from Esau, and he heads to a place where he meets this guy named Laban, who's going to become his father-in-law. And here's what's really cool about this story is that Laban uh, is his father-in-law, but the trickster Jacob now is going to be deceived by his father-in-law because Jacob is out in the field one day, and he's looking at Laban's daughter, the youngest daughter, and he goes, man, she is fine looking. Woo! She is hot. Right? And, and he says to Laban, hey, can I marry her? And Laban goes, oh, yeah, well, just work for me seven years, and then you'll have given me the dowry for my daughter. Okay, and so that's how it works. He works for seven years, and they have a wedding ceremony. But Jacob's a trickster, right? He's about to be deceived by his father-in-law because what Laban does is that he takes the older sister, Leah. Now, here's what you need to know about the two sisters, okay? Rachel's the uh, pretty one, 
Okay? Rachel's the pretty one. Leah's the ugly one. All right? You got to say it like that. Rachel's the pretty one. Leah's the ugly one. All right, so you got the pretty sister and ugly sister. And Laban deceives Jacob. Now, I can't figure this story out. I need to be honest with you. I mean, they're up there, all right? And what Laban does is he switches sisters, all right? And he, 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 they're at their ceremony. Can you imagine Jacob going, hey, I thought your eyes were blue. I thought you were about two foot taller. I don't know what's going on. But he gets deceived, and I don't know how, how like, messed up you got to get at the reception party that you don't know that you're sleeping with the other sister, but it happens, Okay. He wakes up and he goes, good Lord, I'm sleeping with the wrong girl. And he goes back to his father-in-law and says, what's going on? And his father-in-law says, well, hey, look, we, we can't marry the youngest until the oldest is gone. So I, I just I dressed her up and I had you marry the oldest daughter. He says, but if you, want, if you want the pretty one, Rachel, just work for me another seven years. That's 14 years to get the girl of his dreams. Allie and I have had several conversations about whether 14 years would be worth it. And I just want you to know that I'm always in trouble when we have this conversation. And she says to me, I'm worth more than that. And I'm a good husband. And I go, oh, yes, you are. Oh, yes, you are. Husbands, you can turn to your wives. Guys, if you're with a girl right now, turn to her and say, 14 years would be nothing for you right now. Go ahead, go ahead, come on. All right, I didn't hear anybody get smacked. We must have done that well. All right. And so he works another seven years to get his, uh, the girl, the pretty one. And then there's a story about deceiving his father-in-law, and he flees. And, and, and again, a long story short, we now get to, by the way, just pause for a second. How many wives does he have? How many of you think having two wives is going to go well for the story? Guys, guys, do you think Jacob's a smart man? Because you can't keep one girl happy, can you? Right? And ladies, how many of you are sitting there thinking, boy, if there were another lady in this relationship, things would probably go better? Right? You, are anybody here saying that the way it worked? I had one person at the early service stop by and say, well, if she did all the cleaning and cooking, I might be okay with it. All right, now, a man's got two wives, and not only that, but they're sisters. Is this going to go well? No, right? Like the music to the soap opera should be right here again, right? I mean, we should be hearing it going, oh, this is bad news. And we should cut to a commercial right here because you'd all be in suspense going, oh, this is going to go bad. I kind of want to take up an offering just to see if it would work right now. Right? And, and so... And so this is really where the Bible story gets extremely fascinating and interesting because he's got two wives and the whole relationships are built on deception. And Genesis 29 begins to tell the story of the children. Leah, the ugly one, right? Who's married to, to Jacob, all right? Rachel was barren, but Leah begins to have children. And I want you to see what she names her children, all right? She names him Reuben, the first son, the oldest one born, says, now my husband will love me. Do you see dysfunction? Like somebody right now should be dialing Dr. Phil. We have a new family for your show. This is really bad too. Like she needs help. She's looking for something outside of herself to make herself feel valuable and loved. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Teenagers. Let me say that one again. She is looking for something outside of herself and her relationship with God to feel valued and loved. She is dependent upon a man to go, I have value. It's not going to go well, is it? Notice what she names her second son. All right? She names her second son, I am not loved. Her first one said, I will be loved. And now she realizes, no, I'm not loved at all. And then she has a third one. The third one, she says, now at last my husband will become, I love the word, attached to me. Isn't that romantic? You ever turn to your, your girlfriend or wife and say, baby, I love the way we're attached to each other. Like Velcro, right? Nothing romantic about that. She's given up on the idea of love. She's now just saying, I, I just want you to hang with me. I just want you to be with me. I just want to be attached. Can you just throw me a bone every once in a while and sit down and watch TV with me on occasion? Just eat with me on occasion. 
And then she finally has Judah. <clears throat> Apparently between the third son and the fourth son, there's glimpses of health and hope. And she finally says, you know what, I'm going to stop looking at the troubles of my life, and I'm just going to praise God that I have four sons. Genesis 30, because the soap opera doesn't end there, Rachel becomes jealous of her sister. Who saw that coming, huh? Right. She says to Jacob, give me children or I will die. Nothing ever over-dramatized in Scripture, okay? Jacob says, look, I'm not God. I can't do that. And so they devise a plan. She's going to give her maidservant to Jacob. All right? And Jacob's going to sleep with the maidservant. And then by law, the kids will be her kids. And we all know this worked well with Abraham and Sarah, right? Right? This is going to go well, right? And so her maidservant has two kids, number one named Dan. And guess what she names him? She says, God has vindicated me. I've won up my sister. The next one, Nathalie, she, she names him, the great struggle with my sister I have won. Do you see any tension in the family? Right? And I always wondered, like, what's Jacob doing right now? Like, how's he dealing with that? Well, the great deceiver, the great liar, maybe he doesn't even care. I don't know. Right? Genesis 30, uh, 30, verse 9, now Leah gets jealous because apparently Rachel's won favor again. And so she says, well, you did that. I can do that too. My dad can beat your dad up. She doesn't really say it because they're sisters. and That would be weird. All right. But she gives her maidservant to Jacob as well. And Jacob has two more sons, Gad and Asher. And Asher, uh, here's, here's again, she's still not happy. She's still in competition with her sister, not enjoying life at all. Jacob, meanwhile, is like a, a stallion horse being passed around. I knew that was coming. My wife says, I'm sure he's really upset about it, right? Now, here's a great story. Verse 15, the sisters are fighting, okay? The sisters are fighting, and uh, Leah walks in with some fruit, all right? And Rachel says, oh, I really wanted some of that, all right? And, and, and Leah says, well, if you want some of this fruit, you're going to have to let our husband sleep with me tonight. Really? That's what we've come down to? All right, can you imagine you're sitting there in the living room and you see your two wives fighting over you with a piece of fruit? All right, this is the first story in the Bible really about prostitution coming to bear and Jacob's being pimped out, all right? He said, for a piece of fruit, all right? And, and, and Rachel says, well, sure, he can sleep with you as long as I have the fruit. And apparently Leah had an abundance of fruit because it happens twice, all right? And, and so in verse 18, Leah has another same, Issachar, and then she has a second son, Zebulun, and she says at the name Zebulun, it means now my husband will honor me. They have a daughter in there, and in verse 24, God finally smiles on Rachel, and she gives birth to a son, and it has been the theme of our story. The son's name is Joseph. Whew. Man, talk about family troubles, right? All right, and, and, and here's where the story goes in. You know, Joseph's brothers are upset with him. Why? Because he's daddy's favorite. And we know that uh, in Genesis 32, uh, or 35, that Rachel ultimately dies, giving birth to another son named Benjamin. And so Jacob is like that piece of connection to the wife that he loved, the pretty one. And that's the son his dad dawdles over, and he gives him this coat. And he has this dream that his brothers are going to bow at his feet, and he's going to feed them and take care of them, right? And, and we watch the story unfold, and of course, no wonder his brothers are jealous, right? And then they sell him as a slave to Egypt, right? And we know the story because we've been talking about it. Joseph ends up in Egypt, and he ends up in Potiphar's house as a slave. And Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him, right? And it's not working because Joseph loves God more than he loves sex. And, 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 and so he ends up in jail because Potiphar's wife lies to him. And it says that he, he was the guy that, that tried to make it happen when she's the one that tried to seduce him. And there in jail, we have the story of these two guys, they have these dreams, and Joseph interprets a dream, and one of them ends up dead, and one of them ends up working for the king, and Joseph just ends up in jail. And not too long after that, a pharaoh, the king of Egypt, has a dream. And in his dream, he has these seven healthy cows and seven skinny cows, and skinny cows eat the big cows, which is always crazy when you have that dream. That's way too much to drink the night before. And then he has seven good stalks of grain and seven bad ones, and the seven bad stalks of grain eat the seven good ones. And he, he's just terrified by this dream. 
And the cupbearer that, that Joseph interpreted the dream for in jail says, hey, there's this guy in jail that he used to be able to do dream stuff, and they get him. And Joseph tells him, yeah, that's what's going to happen. You're going to have seven years of, of great uh, of, uh, harvest, and then you're going to have seven years of terrible famine. And the, the pharaoh, the king, puts Joseph in charge of all the su- food supply for Egypt. And so Joseph goes from being a slave to no family to the, the, the right-hand man to the king in charge of everything. But guess what? The famine's so severe, so severe that it is throughout the entire land. And now Joseph's brothers have come full circle, and his dream from when he was a kid is realized, and his brothers come looking for food in Egypt. I love it. I love it. I love it. Now, how many of you... Uh, or into the story right now and go, hey, I bet Joseph's just going to be like, hey, brothers, whatever you need, it's good to see you again, right? And these are the guys that sold you into slavery, left you for dead. It's probably been about 50 years since that happened. And here's what it says. When Joseph saw his brothers, Genesis 43, 30, he says that he was deeply moved by the sight of his brothers, and he hurried out and looked for a place to weep. Why? Because he sees his brothers. And can you imagine spending time in jail and being upset with them and being like, you did this to me, and, and spending time being accused by Potiphar's wife and being like, you know what, none of this would have happened if my brothers just wouldn't have. And he's got all this family baggage that he's been carrying around, and for 50 years he's thought, you know what, that's behind me, that's the past, and then like, boom, like that. It's all back in his face. You ever have that moment? Like all the baggage from your family is like, bam, it's right back in your face. You thought you had recovered from that moment, and now it's right in front of you, and you're just so overwhelmed by anger, frustration, emotion. You've got to leave the room and cry. Well, there's a long story right there about how Joseph begins to test his brother's integrity and honesty. And we get to chapter 45, and it says this. They've come back a second time for food. And it says this, Joseph could no longer control himself before his attendants. He sent everyone out of the room. And then he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept loudly. So loud that the Egyptians and Pharaoh and everybody in the household heard about it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers, watch this. His brothers weren't able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. Oh, it's our brother that we just sold into slavery, the one that we thought was dead, and now we here we are. This is the dream he had. Is he going to kill us? Right? I mean, they remember what they did too. Right? The family dysfunction is all alive. Everybody in the room is well aware of it. But we've been talking about this for a while, that when life becomes a mess, we remember you'll get through this. Right? And we remember that, that we don't make any dumb decisions in the midst of dif- difficult times. And that God can use this mess for... Let me try it again. God can use this mess for good, right? And Joseph says this, And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Fifty years of perspective. Fifty years of getting closer to God that has allowed him to say this. He says, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. You Joseph no longer says, you sent me here. He now says, God sent me here. Hey, your family messed up? How long have you been waiting for God to heal those wounds? Joseph was waiting for 50 years. How long have you been praying for that son of yours, that daughter of yours, that mother, that grandfather of yours to come to know Jesus? How long have you been praying for them to stop doing drugs? How long have you been praying for them to stop behaving like fools with money? How long have you been waiting for, hey, have you been waiting 50 years? Because that's, that's how slow God works in the Bible. We have a God that's slow. But he's been working it out for his good, right? And the family dysfunction ultimately ends up coming full full circle because Joseph finds a place to forgive his brothers. And ultimately, if we would continue on with the story, God renames the children. He, He had the same name, but he changes the meaning of their name because he's God and he can do that. And he begins to give them healthy names where their names used to mean, my dad doesn't love me. My mom's a messed up person. And their identities are transformed because of their relationship with God and because one member of the family chose to change the family system. Now, I really wish we could spend about another hour. Does anybody have anything to do? Anybody want to? Okay, my wife says no. 
All right, so what I want to do is I'm just going to quickly give you five keys to healthy family and how to change your system that you're in. Number one, unmask it and be painfully honest. When you are in a recovery group, we say the first thing you got to do is claim that you need help, that this is your situation. Don't be in denial. It's a river in Egypt. All right? That one went right by everybody. Whew, thank you. It was like a slow murmur moving back through. All right? we got to identify the problem and communicate the problem. Hey, the problem is my family has a history of doing. My family has a, a way of, this is how we treat each other. We're going to claim it. Remember this, that God uses pain to get our attention and create discomfort so that we will want to change. If you're never uncomfortable, you don't want to change. Sometimes God will use that pain to create change. And know this, parents, 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 parents. Whoo, you ready? Our past affects our ability to love and care for others in the future. I talk to people every week, and I just sit there and go, but you will never fully love your children, your friends, your husband, your wife, whoever, because you are always dragging around this dead corpse of a past behind you that never lets you fully love somebody else. Number two, get help, sometimes professionally, sometimes with friends. And pray for yourself. Sometimes we forget that we can pray for ourselves. Somewhere along the way, like, we got deceived, and like, we think that it's not right to pray for ourselves. Pray for yourself. But if you need professional help, go get it. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength to go, I need help. We have a professional counselor on staff here at the church if you ever need it. Not me. That's not me, by the way. Number three, recognize the link between your emotional and spiritual health. Your relationship with God matters. You see, I'm in a relationship, and I go, I'm not going to forgive you anymore. And then I turn to the cross and go, oh, Jesus keeps telling me to forgive. Okay, I'll forgive you again. Jesus said 70 times 7. Just a thought for you real quick. Just a thought for you real quick. Just one, one thought for you real quick in this regard. All right? When we turn to God and say, this is what a relationship should look like. And you love me in spite of all I've done. It changes how we interact with everybody else. And by the way, we should always say this. Forgiveness is not the same as forgetting, is it? Okay. Number four. Understand that health and healing are a journey, not a destination. It's not somewhere you arrive at. You're constantly becoming healthier. And finally, Aaron, where do we start? What do I do first? change in any system or family begins with you changing yourself you and God beginning to work on you you want this family over here to change change who you are and how you behave and how you interact with them when they start fighting don't jump in and fight just stand over here and be cool they're all eventually going to go how come you're different you're supposed to be fighting that's what you've always done no I decided to change the family system I don't want to I don't want to behave like this anymore Change in any system or family starts with you changing yourself. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we ask that you guide us and direct us into becoming healthy and whole. We ask that you lead us into places that are different from who we are and who we've been. That you may save our families and reconcile us to you. In your glory and grace, we pray for our families and our friends. Amen. Would you stand and receive your blessing? If you are a guest, we want to remind you that we would love to have a visitor's card filled out. You can grab those on the table on the way out, and we'll trade you that for some free ice cream. That's our official bribe to get your information. Otherwise, I'll see you next week as we begin a new series. Thank you for being here. In the name of our Lord and Savior, who says you don't have to live dysfunctionally, but you can change your story by changing who you are through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go forth and become agents of healing and wholeness. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.